Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at the major battles on the Western Front. Like the previous video, this is providing more contextual knowledge for you to apply to the sources. The specification demands that you know some of the major battles of World War I, but certainly not all of them. So we're going to have a look at the main ones now. These all have some direct relevance to the medical inquiries that we're going to be making as well. Why is this important? Well, in short, when you're studying the sources, you will be expected sometimes to relate the source to events that are going on at the time. So you'll need to know the dates of these events, how they were fought and what some of the challenges were. The First World War is characterised by a war that is quite static rather than one that relied on lots of movement of the armies. Although much of World War I was static, though, and it began and ended with mobile, fast moving warfare. Although we remember the seemingly hopeless slaughter of the war, actually the British Army had some incredible successes. You'll need to know some of these battles in order to provide contextual knowledge to the sources. This can help you understand the sources and recognise the significance of the actions taking place when a source was created. Knowing this can help you explain the usefulness of a source for a given inquiry. Knowing the dates is important here. It can help you relate a particular source to a particular battle. So if you have a source, for example, from July 1916, and it appears to be about the war in France, then you can probably um, imagine that it's going to be about the Battle on the, uh, of the Somme. But let's go through the major battles that we need to look at. The first set of battles, because actually it's not one, relates to the battles of Ypres in Belgium between 1914 and 1918. And yes, I do mean battles here and not a battle. Ypres, or Wipers as the British troops called it, was attacked repeatedly from 1914 until the end of the war, but British, French and Belgian troops never surrendered there. Ypres was the last major Belgian city not controlled by the Germans. It was also the centre of an important road and rail network which we can see in the map there, and this helped link it to places like Calais. Both of these things made it important. Ypres became a salient, a part of the line sticking into the German defences, again which you can see in the map above. The Germans occupied the trenches on higher ground surrounding the city on three sides. This meant that they had a good view of the British soldiers and rained down terrible fire on them. From the photograph at the bottom of this slide we can see an example of the destruction. This is the famous medieval cloth hall and cathedral in Ypres city centre and you can see it's absolutely levelled by the end of the war. Today it's been rebuilt and that's down to German reparations after the First World War. But to go into more detail about that would be more to look at the Germany topic. So let's proceed. So the key events. We've got the first Battle of Ypres in 1914. This is where the British, French and Belgians stopped repeated attempts to take the city. Both sides then dug their trenches and after this battle the German, Germans partly surrounded Ypres. We've also got the second Battle of Ypres in 1915. This was a second huge German effort to take Ypres. It failed, but it also marked the first widespread use of poison gas in World War I. Previously, tear gas had been used, but that's not poisonous, it's just irritating. And then we have the third Battle of Ypres, better known as Passchendaele. This occurred in 1917. This was a huge British and Allied effort to push the Germans back. It started well. The British had dug tunnels under German positions and laid enormous mines, literally destroying several hilltops where the Germans were based, such as at Hill 60. But then the weather and the heavy mud of Ypres prevented real success, with tens of thousands killed in the, in the fighting. In 1917, very uh, little ground was actually gained. Examples of the conditions can be seen in the photograph. You can pause the video here and make some notes if you wish. Our next key battle is the Battle of the Somme, which occurred between July and November 1916. Occasionally, mistakenly, people only remember this as occurring on the 1st of July 1916, because that was a particularly devastating day, but the battle was much longer, as you can see. In Britain, this is easily the most famous battle of the First World War. The battle was supposed to be a huge breakthrough, winning the war. On the very first day, though, it became clear that it would not work. Despite a week-long artillery bombardment on the 1st of July 1916, the British Army lost 19,240 men killed and nearly 50,000 men wounded. And they become relevant when we look at the pressure that was put on the medical services. The bombardment had not killed the Germans, it only warned them of the attack to come. The battle is seen as a huge failure of planning and the generals in charge have been criticised for not doing more to protect the soldiers. But the Germans suffered too, it has been argued that they never recovered from their losses at this battle. By November the British had suffered around 420,000 men killed, wounded and captured. The Germans had lost around 440,000. 
All this death and, and destruction put an extraordinary pressure on the medical services, who had expected to only receive 10,000 casualties a day, not 60,000 on the first day. For all this, the British advanced at most seven miles. But historians are disagreeing about how much good it did in the long run, given the German losses. If you want to pause the video here and make some notes, you can do so. Our next battle, and one with particular direct relevance to medical services, is the Battle of Arras between April and May 1917. The Battle of Arras was unusual in comparison to other World War I battles in some respects, but like others it did not achieve the breakthrough that the British wanted, and it cost 150,000 killed, wounded and captured. One of the unique aspects of the battle was the terrain. The land was based on chalk, this was easy and safe to dig, and so large networks of tunnels were dug to provide cover for the men. There was an underground hospital too, with enough beds for 700 casualties. The tunnels were even fitted with electric light and running water. An example of this can be seen in the top two photographs. The battle also used extensive use of aeroplanes to spy on the Germans and to attack German troops. It was costly for the British. Superior German planes and pilots meant a British pilot had a life expectancy during these missions of around 18 hours. It became known as Bloody April. Next up we have the Battle of Cambrai. This is between November and December in 1917. The Battle of Cambrai saw the British try and use new weapons and tactics to break through the German lines. And they did break through, but not for long. The British decided not to risk warning the Germans of attack by not having an artillery bombardment at the start of the attack. Instead they sent in a secret weapon, 378 tanks. The Germans couldn't destroy the heavy armour of the tanks and so they fell back in panic. At least that's what the British historians would have us believe. The tanks broke through, but couldn't hold on to the captured ground. It's worth pointing out that this isn't the first use of tanks in battle. That was at fleur Causalet, which was part of the Battle of the Somme, but where the tanks were horribly unreliable. But at Cambrai they had matured to a point where they were more dependable. However, the commanders hadn't really realised this. Surprised by the success of the tanks, the British were too sent to slow in infantry reinforcements, and the Germans captured most of the land back. Despite the failure to support the tank, the new tactics actually worked. In 1918, these new tactics, a short artillery bombardment if they had one at all, a breakthrough with tanks, backed by aircraft and rapid support from the soldiers, would be used to push the Germans back for 100 days in a row, winning the war. So when you think about the artillery bombardments of the Battle of the Somme and the warning that they gave, Cambrai showed a new way of doing things. When you compare the army of 1918 with the army of 1914, there's a massive amount of progress. But we need to look, be focused more on the medical services here. And so when you're remembering these events, you relate them to what you're reading about. For example, you may find sources about blood transfusions, which were used in the most significant way in the Battle of Cambrai, for example. So remember the dates, remember the context of the battles, and relate it to the sources that you study. Our final points then. World War I is remembered for static trench warfare, but there were instances of mobile warfare too. Powerful defensive weapons made it difficult to attack enemy trenches. Both sides developed new technologies to help them advance, including aircraft, gas and tanks. The battles around Ypres between 1914, 1917 and all the way up to 1918 were characterised by muddy conditions and heavy casualties. The second battle saw the first use of poison gas, and later vast underground mines were dug to blast the German line. The Battle of the Somme in 1916 started with the deadliest day in British military history before settling into a months-long battle of attrition. It also saw the first use of the tank. The Battle of Arras saw the use of vast underground hospitals which treated the wounded safe from artillery fire. British aircraft suffered their worst losses of the war in this period. And the Battle of Cambrai in autumn 1917 saw the first use of tanks in large numbers but ultimately failed to break the deadlock. However, lessons learned during this battle helped the British to break through in 1918. That's the end of this rapid revision video. I hope it's been useful to you, and if it has, please like the video, and you can subscribe to the channel. And remember, it is important to know this context and to know the dates when you are relating them to the sources that you'll have to study. But for now, I'll say thank you for watching, and goodbye.